Hi, you're listening to Inside the Nudge Unit, a podcast from the Behavioural Insights team. I'm Alex Chiani, and today we've got a massive treat for you. In February this year, I was lucky enough to join a conversation between our CEO, Professor David Halpin, and the New South Wales Minister for Customer Service, Victor Dominello. For our international listeners, Victor has been a long-standing advocate for building government services around customers, which he's been doing since becoming an MP in 2008. New South Wales were also one of the first adopters of Behavioural Insights outside the UK, and we'll hear some of the Minister's reflections on this at the end of the podcast. David and Victor had a really in-depth conversation, which covered how BI can improve economic policy, how markets can be made more transparent, and when government should intervene in markets. The fact that David and Victor were able to have such an enthusiastic conversation was impressive, given that it took place first thing in the morning for us here in Sydney, and late at night for David. Sadly, my recorder also got a little bit excited, uh, so you might hear a little crackle when the conversation um, really starts to pop. Uh, I'll be back at the end, but let's kick off with the Minister explaining why we should all have a Minister for Customer Service. Well, there's a number of layers to the Ministry for Customer Service, but at, at its heart is putting people first. Traditionally, governments have many arms, more arms than the goddess Durja, but uh, we don't treat people first, uh, we put them last. A lot of governments have a similar starting narrative, but they then don't put their money where their mouth is. So they don't have a minister, Victor, like you, nor a department to actually do it. Around the world, a lot of people try to brand it up, but they don't do the structural changes required to, to actually operationalize it and what we've done inside the government we've changed the way uh, the committee structures work and that means if you've got a policy decision coming up uh, through the works it's got to go through our gateway first and i basically asked three questions what's your data architecture what's your digital design and what's your customer lens because if you don't uh, tick those boxes then you're not even going to be permitted to go to treasury to get your money let alone go to cabinet get to get the final sign off so that's been the thing that's really changed uh, the the dynamics here in New South Wales. So how do you decide which areas to prioritise? Well, the most important thing that guides me is what the Premier uh, has told me a couple of years ago. And she said, look, go for high impact. What, what are the ideas that are going to, is going to have the highest impact on the most amount of people? So we're going to prioritise that. Uh, or it could be a, a, another pain point around uh, that involves multiple agencies. Uh, again, uh, one agency on their own won't do it, uh, or they'll do their own piece, but no one's going to do that whole government lens that puts the citizen in the driving seat. So th that's generally what we tend to look for. Most people have heard of nudge, the idea that you might kind of gently prompt, you know, consumer citizens trying to help them make better choices for themselves or whatever. But also, um, Richard Taylor and others Cass, have, have coined the term more recently of sludge, which is the reverse, either inside governments or actually often by consumer players who add in extra frictions. And this is something which I think you're one of the first governments in the world to have really actually picked up on in a serious way. And maybe if we could talk a little bit about this and also the idea of sludge audits, which you've started to, to do. Yeah, well, sludge is uh, just disgusting by uh, design and it slows things down in a very, very messy way. Uh, and it's just, it just amounts to an appalling customer experience. And what I tend to see is uh, form after form after form, uh, and in each of the forms asking for the same types of information uh, from the poor customer. Uh, so what we're trying to do uh, with the use of the Behavioural Insights Unit, uh, the Data Analytics Centre, which I call the DAC, and a whole lot of other specialised agencies inside of government is to find where the sludge is and then to get the big fire hose out and clean it up. But I wonder if you might want to talk through a bit more detail, an example, um, you know, and, and how you sort of got the department and government really to kind of work its way through it. Well, there's, for example, we've created a unit now called Service New South Wales for Business. Uh, and the reason we've done that is, you know, on the back of the pandemic, we've realised that small businesses in particular are really going to struggle on, on the other end of uh, when the economic lifeboats start sailing away. Uh, and we realised that for businesses, uh, 
here, they have about 21 different touch points within government, 21. Uh, 21 different agencies right across New South Wales that are trying to look after business. Now, if you've got 21 people talking in your ear, that's not looking after you, that's confusing you. Uh, so we've created one touch point, service of business, a business concierge, they speak to that person, that person uh, then can go into the deep wells of expertise within government to find out what the business requires. Now, we obviously road tested this concept. We asked businesses, you know, what were their pain points and their normal pain points uh, are pretty easy to understand. Uh, too much red tape, they need money uh, and they need data, they need more information. Uh, and this really touches on the last piece. You know, when you're getting drowned in information, you're not really getting information at all. Uh, and this is pretty much anywhere you look across government, David, uh, and I'm sure you'd agree, there's so much sludge because it's built up over time. You know, it's not like you and I are sitting in a room and designing government from scratch. It is just appalling how much sludge there is. One question is the extent to which it should be government's business to also try and reduce sludge, not only within government, but beyond um, as well. Oh, I, I'm particularly exercised by the market because I, I just really believe that the market is the, the greatest engine for innovation and, and it's at the heart of um, our capitalist society. Ultimately, the market for it to operate efficiently needs to have transparency. Uh, and in medieval times, uh, there was interventions in the market. So they go into the marketplace and say, sorry, uh, this is what an actual pound is well this is what an actual foot is uh, because various vendors would say no no this is a pound no this is a foot and the foot's you know probably two inches shy so you know there's constant intervention into the market uh, to provide consumer confidence the marketplace in 2021 is pretty much online when the marketplace is online we need to extend those interventions uh, into a 21st century setting. So I really believe that the more market transparency, particularly around pricing that we can provide, uh, the better the market will be. So as you know, I love this stuff. I think it's really interesting. Um, as we've talked about before, um, I think one of the striking thing about behavioral economics in general is even though there's now three, arguably four Nobel prizes in it, it hasn't really been applied that much to economic policy. A lot of governments seem to have this belief Certainly in the Anglo-Saxon world, kind of the best thing you can do is just get out of the way and let the market do its thing. Um, and that's hard to square with what we know about consumers, but it's quite a difficult thing. Where should you reach into and where should, should you not? So one of the things I love about what you've been doing, and it does seem to be actually it's a lot you personally, my sense of it has driven it in New South Wales, is you've kind of rolled up your sleeves and you've got into some markets, not to shut them down, but actually to make them work better. Um, so I'd love to just to talk about a couple of those examples in a bit more detail. Um, and I mean, I know there are some of them which have certainly attracted our attention more generally, but one of them is the insurance market, which is a really interesting one. I mean, across the world, insurance markets are quite striking in how they're operating. They are literally, it is the most expensive word, I think I'm right in saying, to buy on Google search for a company because they're all desperately to get you. I think it's one of the remarkable successes that you've achieved in relation to what you've done in the insurance market in New South Wales. Oh, thanks, David. So we undertook massive reform in relation to uh, compulsory third-party insurance about four or five years ago now. And one of the pain points that we uh, constantly came across was that uh, the consumers were confused because it was all wrapped in subclauses and exceptions and quite frankly you need a law degree to, to work your way through so um one of the things we said in the reform is look uh you're going to have to display your price so we are comparing apples with apples and we created a platform where we weren't getting a commission on the side uh it was a it was a platform where every insurance product had to be there uh, the consumers could then rate it and people could see, you know, genuinely uh, what they thought of each other's uh, product. Um, and that was really our, our first toe in the water in relation to market, I'll call it intervention, but in many ways it's market cleansing uh, because, you know, I just want to get rid of the shadows in the market so I can operate uh, more efficiently. 
So I've actually got a couple of the numbers here just to share with um, people across the world who may be less familiar with it. I think it's called the Green Slip price, you know, or pre pre Green Slip um, in, in New South Wales, right, which is basically a, a, a car insurance, yeah, exactly. um, which I think has been around for nearly 20 years, 18 years. And by um, 2016, it was about $650, 652. And the reforms look like they've driven it down by, well, nearly $130, a 20% odd reduction. Um, but also it's improved other aspects of it, because one argument is that when you introduce these kind of reforms, you might move it on the price, but you wouldn't move it on other things. So people had very long delays, right? Even if they did have a claim, it could be three, four, five years. That's also improved. So it's not just the price, but the quality is also. Oh, absolutely. Is that, is that a correct understanding? Absolutely. Like It's one of the uh, signature reforms of the government uh, over the last 10 years, because uh, this has been a reform in, in the making for 16 years. No one's uh, wanted to tackle it. In fact, the uh, the former uh, minister described it as the first 30 minutes of saving Private Ryan uh, because you'd have insurers on one side going to war and then you'd have the lawyers on the other side going to war and, and poor motorists in the middle uh, paying the price. And, and what we saw year after year after year for 16 years uh, was an increase in the premiums and, and poor outcomes. Uh, but as a result of the reforms we introduced, which provided a lot more transparency for consumers to exercise their muscle, uh, was a reduction in the price. Not only that, uh, we're getting far better uh, results in terms of getting people uh, healthier faster because they're getting access to uh, medical services quicker. And there's a whole lot of other uh, drag points that we took out of the system. From a classical point of view, that this is a competitive market. It should have just sorted it out anyway and driven price down, number one. But also number two, that you actually didn't wait for a price comparison site, because that's what happens in a number of places in the world, and they have their own problems, actually. But you, you actually, again, literally rolled up your sleeves and got New South Wales to, to drive the comparisons, right? Oh, absolutely. Well, maybe I can just draw you on both on both those points, why you think the market wasn't solving it, but then also why you felt the right thing to do was for government itself to step into driving the sort of switching engine. Well, the market clearly wasn't solving it because uh, the prices were still going north. Uh, and, and the reality is uh, when you listen to the customers, they, they, they were constantly complaining as well, saying it's still confusing. So I had to you know, literally intervene. I remember speaking to the insurers as part of the reform and saying, this is non-negotiable. I am sorry, we will design it uh, and then everybody will be part of it. It's If you've got a motor vehicle, you must have this product. So it's not like it's an option. Uh, you've got a captured audience here, insurers. So you will play by our rules and we're putting the customers first. Yeah, it's really interesting. Um, do you think there's a reason why also, why somebody else doesn't, as it were, step into the market? to try and do the comparison bit? That, that's a great question because I, I, I'm toying with the same or I'm, I'm tussling with the same um, problem in relation to car parking. So I'm about to hold a summit in, uh, in relation to car parking of all things uh, in, in March this year. And this is my frustration. Um, we've got about 150 odd councils here in New South Wales uh, and each of them have got their own app uh, and in their app, they've says uh, that will demonstrate, you know, you can park here using our app, you can pay your rates here using our app, et cetera, et cetera. But if I'm traveling between Parramatta, which is Western Sydney to uh, Sydney CBD, about 30 kilometers, I'm traversing probably six council areas. Does that mean as a customer, I'm going to have to download six different apps in the event that I want to try and park anywhere between Parramatta and the city. How on earth is that a good customer experience? It's a shocking experience. No one's going to do it. And it means that there's going to be more traffic because people are going around the streets looking for parking. In fact, uh, the latest stat we saw is about a third of the traffic is allocated to people just looking for a car park spot. So if we can take some of that friction out by getting a single platform where regardless of whether you're on Ride Council or Lane Cove Council or Willoughby Council, you must share your data onto a common platform so that the customer can ultimately have a bird's eye view across the state. And then you, you're creating a genuine smart state there that will have significant uh, positive impacts 
on the traffic and parking situation, let alone the customer experience here in New South Wales. So that's another thing that we're teasing out uh, in March. We should drop in one more. Um, I think certainly I've always been very impressed by because we tried to do it in Downing Street and couldn't get it through. Is the work also um, transport related? Is that what you did on fuel prices? Yes. Um, we I remember discussing this in the UK. I was like, wouldn't it be good to have these kind of price comparisons and so on? It was all too difficult. But then you went ahead and did it. So it was like, well, <laughs> how did he do that? But maybe talk a little bit about that example again for people outside of New South Wales. Oh, uh, yes. So fuel check was, uh, you know, it's a throwback in many ways, a frustration throwback of when I was driving around Sydney as a poor uh, university student in my Suzuki Sierra and I couldn't afford the petrol. And I'd go from you know, petrol station to petrol station and it's like, you know, thinking I'm, I'm gonna get lucky. Next, next petrol station I get, it's gonna be cheaper. And sure enough, it was more expensive. And I thought, geez, one, wouldn't it be easier uh, if it was all in one place so you could see in advance where to go. Um, sure enough, as, as, uh, as, as the universe has dictated, I've, I then became the Minister for Regulation. I thought, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to exact my revenge on petrol prices. And, uh, and I said to them, uh, sorry, uh, you're going to have one place. You're going to have to display it. You, you're already required to display it on the street. And for obvious uh, behavioural reasons, we don't want people driving in uh, causing traffic, saying, what's your petrol price? And then driving out because you weren't happy. So you have to display it on the street. I'm saying, well, if you already have to display it on the street, in the digital world, you're now going to be forced to display it online and we'll create that platform for you. The resistance I had was unbelievable. Like the world was going to fall apart. I was going to disrupt the, the entire economy. Prices were going to soar. You know, every excuse under the sun. I... At the end, I had to actually get legislation in, into Parliament, to force them to do it. Um, and now it's been done. It's been up and running now for a number of years. Last time I checked, uh, we had uh, 1.4 million downloads. Every TV station at night regularly refers to the fuel check price. Uh, and they tell you very quickly what's the cheapest, what's the most expensive. Uh, we've had over 50,000 people give us feedback with an astonishing 95% thumbs up. And we continually uh, continue to improve the product based on uh, customer feedback. So yeah, it was, my, it was my first foot in the door, my Petri dish, and I'm really proud of it because it's working really well. Yeah, and I have a stat here from, I think National Roads and Motors Association that estimates that if you use it regularly, you can save about $500 a year. Uh, and when you go and speak to petrol stations, they've said that fuel check has absolutely changed the way they do things now. So uh, they now know that if they put a, a good competitive price, they are getting people from all around Sydney going there, whereas before it was just a local trade. No, it's very interesting. One thing uh, people haven't noticed because it happened slowly is, of course, in most countries, there are far few places where you go and fill up your, with your car now because cars can go further. But it also means that the stations are further apart. So you are, it's literally kind of roulette. If you're on the motorway and you're thinking, oh, do I need to fill up? What's that price? You actually don't get very many choices. And so you get these garages that merge, essentially gouge prices, um, and they do it routinely, right? Absolutely. And I want to see these prices uh, go onto Apple Maps and Google Maps. And then, you know, smart cars in the future, uh, it won't be petrol, it'll be electricity. Uh, but they'll be able to give you options in terms of saying, well, look, we're, we're low, we need to charge up. Uh, you know, I can go five kilometres in this direction uh, and uh, at this price or six kilometres in this direction with a one kilometre detour at that price. Uh, you make a decision as to whether a saving of $10 is worth your five minutes. You know, this is where we, I want to end up, but we're not going to get there unless we get the information online in real time. So what I love about these examples is that I think for a lot of people it will feel like, oh, it's almost common sense, but it hasn't been common sense in a lot of economics textbooks or government practice. The, um, the economist, wonderful economist at um, Harvard, David Labson, has contrasted how some markets seem to work very well. So if I turn up in Sydney and I don't know the price of buying a banana, 
I'm not going to find someone come and say, would you here, I can sell you a banana for $200, right? Like the market doesn't even offer it. The market operates in certain situations to get rid of that. But in other examples, like you mentioned insurance, to some extent petrol or gas, um, it, it does seem to do that. And it, instead it evolves in a different way um, and it doesn't find an equilibrium, which is actually lowering prices. And to, to work out why it does or doesn't, I mean, a lot of the examples you give, and I think bear on friction issues, like just the extra hassle. It's really, really important in terms of how it affects how the market functions. Um, and so then it raises the question of, well, what is the role of government? I guess I wonder what are the other ones that are on your list that you think are also not functioning in that way? Oh, there, there is so many. So, for example, uh, in the building sector, uh, I'm there. There isn't a sector that I have not had a desire to digitise. And uh, I say in my office, I'm going to digitise the bejesus out of it. So, uh, I'm 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 on a war path in relation to the construction sector. Um, I haven't even started uh, in in the other areas, but um, you know, in any given arm of government, there is so much sludge or grit that just uh, creates friction unnecessary for the consumer and therefore poor performance or suboptimal performance of the marketplace. Can I draw you a little bit on the political narrative? Because one of the traditional things on the right would be government should you know, not get involved in markets, let them do their thing. And on the left, there's often a kind of deep suspicion of markets, often the temptation to shut them down or you know, close. And, and you found a different pathway, I think, between those positions. So. How do you how do you tell that story politically? Well, my strong view is that I want a healthy marketplace. Quite frankly, if if you're for jobs, you're for innovation. You want that marketplace to be as you know, as 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 healthy as an Olympic athlete. But unfortunately, it's not the case. And there's this temerity within governments uh, all around the world for for different reasons as you articulated, not to intervene. I think it's unacceptable. It is absolutely unacceptable, and and we're not doing the right thing. You know, whether it's tax reform or market reform, you know, we have to continue our drive for reform to make things easier. One of the arguments, in fact, insurance markets are one of the examples often used in in wider literature, is that if you just get perfect transparency on price, what will happen is that the um, it will only compete on price and you'll get you'll get products ever simpler and strip but they'll strip out all kinds of other things which might be of value and the consumer made it so easy for consumers they won't read other small print or other details but my understanding of what you did on the insurance stuff is you've also put alongside it other information around customer satisfaction or performance so it's not only price so because it almost you make it sound very easy well i digitized it and so on but you've actually done a lot of other things as well which have improved market function. Absolutely, because yeah, you know, I'm I'm a consumer like everybody else, like you, like every all all the listeners here. They every day they're out there uh, buying and selling products. So, you know, when when I go online, or uh, the very first thing I look for is, you know, depending on what the product is or service is, I'll look for the price, and then I'll also look at the reviews, because. I, I, I'm not. I'm not a tire kicker. I'm just not going to say I, I want the cheapest thing in the market. I, I want something that's good. It's got quality as well. And I just think the example's already there. And and what we've done in insurance has demonstrated that if you do the quality and the price, you provide consumer with optimal information to make an informed decision. And again, it just leads to to better outcomes all around. So you've you've worked on it both on the. Um, the government side trying to take out sludge and so on but also you've intervened in the in the private sector on some fairly kind of well defined markets but the logic of what you're saying in principle can apply to lots of other domains too so someone trying to decide what career to pursue what a young person trying to decide their apprenticeship scheme or um in relation to the other end you know the care the care home for your elderly parent or whatever these look like they're absolutely on the interface where there's maybe price issues involved, but lots of quality ones too. And do you feel that there are similar kind of work to be done in, in these types of areas? Oh, absolutely. When, when I look at, uh, you know, trying to find a, a place for your loved one in terms of retirement or a nursing home, like it is, it, it's like being mired in a labyrinth. It is so hard and particularly at a time where you need uh, assistance, like, you, you need a broker. That's how bad it is. You know, 
you, you, you know that the market is failing when you need somebody specialized to help you understand it. It, it should be very easy to, to understand this is a good place, uh, this is the price, and, and these are the reviews. It's not complicated, but there are so many, as again, so many shadow lands uh, within various sectors in the market that need, need a good dose of the uh, sun lamp. Um, but, you know, it's a constant battle, David, constant battle. I, I, I can only fight the ones right in front of me, but geez, if, if I had my time, I'd do the whole lot. Yeah, I agree. Care homes, actually, I think a particularly sharp one. Also, because providers themselves don't really want to compete on price alone. But I, mean, I certainly think it's true in the UK and a lot of other countries. It is very hard to find information, of course, about price, but also about quality and so Absolutely. on. Absolutely. Um, it, it goes to, and to some extent, it was an interesting point sometimes made about educational choices or even labor market choices, what job to do, where, you know, it's someone said that the world's best data scientists are working out what you should watch, you know, on TV tonight. Um, but if you're trying to work out what, you know, course you should choose for your life, it's like, well, good luck. Maybe go and talk to the PE teacher, you know. The other thing, you mentioned that very interesting phrase with broker. Some markets need a broker. And this is why I think, again, New South Wales has been interesting because some places brokers have emerged which are themselves private sector players mm. but they then have brought a next layer of issues so where there are switching sites on insurance where you've been active we sometimes see in markets where what happens is that they're, now you've got another problem which is to choose your switching site it's unbelievable and can you choose can you trust your switching site because and they themselves have the problem of the acquiring customers and then they spend a lot of money on advertising and teaser rates in order to get the customer. So now the market, instead of competing and dysfunctioning at the level of the individual provider of the insurance product, is now starting to dysfunction if you're not careful on the next level. So it does raise the question of, well, so exactly what is the thing, where's the point at which the state should step in and where should it stay out? Well, I, I guess having, having a look at that broker example, I, I, you know, why do you need a broker in the first place? because things are just so complicated. Those brokers existed uh, a lot in the insurance play uh, and they were again resistant to reform, but we, we drove that through because we said, look, we don't need brokers anymore. You know, so we, 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 you don't need them because we're simplifying it. So you know, customers can be informed just by having a look themselves. So can I ask you, you mentioned on the fuel um, kind of price issue that it was kind of almost your student experience, but is there anything else that makes you, why have you done this and so many other governments and ministers haven't? Is there something weird about your brain, Victor, or some other experience that you've had that makes you push into this area where so, so many have feared to tread? No, I think it's just uh, something weird about my brain, David. I, I, don't think <laughs> I think I'm pee-headed. I, I, I don't know. I just, you know, you get into life, uh, public life to make a difference and you know, there, there is some levers that you can pull that will have a profound change. And, um, and again, on my side of politics, I, I just think that I really believe in the value of the market and in innovation. And, and the best thing, the easiest thing I could do, sorry, it's not easy to do at all, it's very hard, but the most powerful thing we can do is to, uh, to exercise that market. We should spend at least a couple of minutes on COVID. Sure. Um, of course, Australia, New South Wales done rather better than the UK, the US and elsewhere. Um, but uh, it would be great to learn some of the lessons because I know you've used some of the same approaches on service design and digitization to get some of the wins that you've had. And I thought maybe it's worth talking a bit about that. I was fortunate enough to be asked to be part of the, uh, the crisis cabinet. So the premier from day one, just assembled five ministers around her, herself, uh, in the deputy premier, the treasurer, minister for health and myself. And uh, a number of my colleagues said, why are you in crisis cabinet? You know, what, what's customer service got to do with all this? Well, uh, we've got Service New South Wales, we're the regulator, uh, we've got access to a lot of data and, and that was critical, particularly around the mobility data that we were doing the analysis around at the beginning. Um, to, to feed into our intel. So um, during the early phases, uh, I remember having a look around the world uh, at, at who, was, who was leading the field and of all places was Taiwan uh, for, for, 
for sound reason. They they went through SARS and MERS and they're right next to China. And sure enough, when you look at what China, uh, Taiwan was doing, they had the temperature checks. Uh, they had uh, they had QR codes. They, they, they were pretty much the first horse out of the gate and, and they were way ahead of the field. And I, I remember saying um, to the team, like, why aren't we doing the temperature checks? Why aren't we doing the QR codes? Why aren't we doing the masks? Eventually they all rolled out, but it, it took time for it to come on, on board. The first resistance in relation to the QR code was, um, uh, my co some of my colleagues would say, oh, look, Victor, like, you know, this is gonna be an impost on business. We can't, we can't ask businesses to put QR codes and then ask customers to wave their phone. Half of them don't even have a smartphone. All the mythology about you know, digital adoption came out. And I said to them, listen, you are literally shutting down the economy. I don't think they're gonna worry about two minutes worth of downloading an app. Uh, so I, I didn't win that battle. Um, they, they said, well, look, we'll let you do it. Uh, but it's got to be opened up for everybody. Everybody can have their own QR code. So I said, well, look, look, that's not going to be a great customer experience because you know, every time I go from one cafe to another, I'm going to have to enter in my data again. It's a shocking experience. Sure enough, uh, people were, were complaining about it. We got to a point where I, I finally won the battle uh, in on the 1st of January this year where we mandated the service QR codes uh, for the high risk venues. There's one thing I don't actually know if you guys did this or not. We, when for our current kind of COVID secure and QR system, I thought it would also be good to do is to have it two way so that um, customers might also be able to comment on whether the business itself seemed COVID secure. And it because otherwise we didn't, there's no way we don't have an army of inspectors. But my argument was you do have an army of inspectors, they're called customers. Spot on. We started rolling that out with, um, with fuel check. And, and that's why, uh, you know, I love fuel check as well, because to your exact point, I don't need a thousand inspectors out there. Every customer is my inspector. So if there is a price differential in terms of what was advertised online and what they're actually paying at the Bowser, uh, there's a, a, a real simple uh, widget that enables a customer to complain. That complaint goes straight to the Department of Fair Trading, who will pick up the phone within seconds and say, um, I've just been told that uh, your price does not match what you've advertised. So yeah, every customer has the power to be an inspector and, and the same with the, the COVID check-in. So in fact, I was reading the feedback uh, last night. It was quite funny because um, one customer was uh, saying there was a cockroach crawling around the floor. But look, all feedback's good feedback. Um, but yeah, we, we have put that, um, that loop in to, to enable us to, to check on which businesses are doing the right thing and which are not. Other areas where you feel um, you're, you have a twinkle in your eye about where we could be more behavioral and innovative in, in government, either in New South Wales or across the world? Oh, look, there's so many reforms I've got uh, in my mind at the moment. Another pain point that there will be a lot of behavioral insight is in relation to e-regulation. Uh, that's been a holy grail of mine for the last four or five years. I'm determined to land that this year. Uh, in the past, what governments tend to do, uh, there'd be pendulum swings between uh, centralists and federalists. Uh, the centralists would say, all power must uh, come from, from me, the minister, or me, the premier, or me, the prime minister, or the department of premier and cabinet, uh, and uh, you will do as I say. And then when the pendulum goes too far that direction, you, you're too far away from the grassroots. Uh, and then you don't see the nuances uh, on the ground. And then there'll be a change of government and then the pendulum will go on the other direction. And then you'll devolve all power to the grassroots. But then there's lack of coordination and people say, well, look, we're, you know, it's all over the shop. We're, we're not getting a great customer experience because we got too many masters now. So then the pendulum will go back the other direction. I'm going to create an e-regulator platform, which I'm basically the, the end goal is to say, look, if you want your regulation to be effective, i.e. have the force of law, it must sit on the e-regulator platform. Because once it's on that platform, then it's, I've got some control in terms of harmonization, taxonomy, and a whole lot of things and visibility so that we don't have 
one inspector going out on a Monday, another one out on a Tuesday, another one out on a Wednesday, and again, enables us to provide a far better customer experience. If you were sat in California, you might think, well, it's all very well what this minister, you know, Victor Dominello is up to, but let's face it, it's digital markets, it's Google, it's Facebook, it's Instagram, it's Smart, you know, whatever. The world's moving with these great global entities. And how you know, can you sit in, in a government in New South Wales or Australia, or frankly, even the European Commission, what can you do, basically? Government needs to get in there, but we need to build a trust architecture around it because I don't want government having all, all power uh, and you know, go from a, a, a government surveillance to a corporate surveillance. You, you need trust um, you know, structures in place. So you know, these are some of the deep discussions that we need to have right around the world in the next decade or so, um, particularly if we, you know, we want to, to progress, uh, in my view, use data and digital to, uh, to reduce suffering and improve lives. So I agree, by the way, I, I also think there is room to do some of the things you've done in other areas, essentially government to step in to be a broker of the brokers or a broker yeah. to help inform. Definitely. Um, I mean, a, a wonderful example, I think, some work actually the Behavioural Insights team in Australia did with uh, Fairfax Foundation is just talking to young people about their experiences digitally online or a version in the UK done by the Royal Society of Public Health, actually, um, which just asked 15 year olds about their experience, the impact it had on them using different platforms. And it showed very rapidly, if you're a 15 year old, Instagram made you feel like crap, you know, <laughs> whereas YouTube might be bad for your sleep, but it didn't make you feel like crap. So um, actually revealing that and putting it in the hands of parents as she shakes and reshapes the market. Um, and of course, Facebook itself had a quite a bloody nose from what was picked up in Australia about some of its practices, which changed its practice globally. So I think I, I agree with you. I think governments, particularly headed by innovative ministers and prepared to take some chances, who can mobilize the experiences of their citizens, are, have a lot of power to reshape these forces. So I do salute what you're doing. I think it's remarkable. And I hope that this discussion we picked up more widely um, by a few other ministers across the world who might feel a bit more bold about how they intervene in, in markets. Well, as, as I say to uh, other ministers, uh, David, like if, if you want a success story, do a fuel check or, or do something that the people love because they'll keep talking about it. So I, I don't know where the resistance is because if you give people what they love they uh, and it's a good thing, you normally get rewarded for it. So if there are any other ministers currently listening to this, then surely those last words should be a call to arms. As I mentioned at the beginning of the podcast, the New South Wales government were one of the first governments to set up a behavioural insights unit outside of the UK. Listeners will remember some of the stories about the work that we did with them on domestic violence in an earlier podcast. Therefore, it would be remiss of me not to get David and Victor's reflections on the team's work to finish the interview. Over to David. Back in you know, 2010, when the Behavioural Insights team was created in Downing Street, one of the first governments, um, I think by 2012, was in contact with was New South Wales and then set up and we sent over a very own Rory Gallagher request. And New South Wales, I think, did do a whole clutch of some of the most interesting sort of first and second generation Behavioural Insights trials from fines, quite significant reductions on, the, on domestic violence interventions, on getting injured workers back to work. Um, and so I think it really was one of the early innovators um, to show what's been possible. And even now, I often see examples from Canada and elsewhere. You think, you know what? That's pretty much exactly what New South Wales done. It's been copied from you guys. Um, so I think it is credit. And it's really interesting to see how that's evolved. Victor, particularly since you've been involved, um, layered on with the digital and also this active reaching into markets. Um, and so I think in that combination is something which is still very special to bring together those kind of in a particular combination, which is a lesson for what the next 10 years might look like, not just the, the last 10. Oh, well, thanks, David. But uh, we took your lead. You, you know, you, you've been the uh, the father of this around the world. So it was easy to follow in your big footsteps. But it, it has been a humbling experience to, to be a minister because I, I don't have the expertise, but to see the, uh, the deep well of um, passionate people in the Behavioural Insights Unit here is just... It, it really is inspiring. Like just recently, uh, because of the Behavioural Insights Unit, we improved retesting rates by 11%. Now, people say, well, 11%, it's not 50, but 
11% could make a difference between a pandemic blowing out of control or keeping it manageable. So it's, you know, a day doesn't go past where we don't think, geez, what's the BI unit think about this? How do we improve outcomes uh, in terms of, you know, controlling the pandemic in this case or you know, getting better economic event, uh, outcomes in terms of the other side of the pandemic in the years to come? That was the discussion that David Halpin had with Victor Dominello, the Minister for Customer Service here in New South Wales, Australia. Thanks to David and the Minister for letting me record their conversation and to Ellie Wood at the Minister's Office for setting it up. Thanks also to Dave Trudinger and Eva Koromiles and the team at the Behavioural Insights Unit. If you're interested in learning more about the work that they've been doing on sludge and other things, you can follow the link in the description. Thanks also to Rich O'Brien for original music and our editor Evan at Pixel Live Studio. Finally, and most importantly, thanks to you for listening. And thanks in advance for telling all your friends and family about this podcast. Stay safe and we will see you soon.